it was really all about using the platform that I had been given from from basketball to make a difference, to make an impact, and um, to have a message that people would listen to and gravitate towards. Um, ultimately, to end the very thing that I saw as a kid, which is domestic violence, right? Um, and so we've been able to impact more than a million kids across the country, man, uh, teaching them how to value and respect one of the girls, yeah. My dog, Shane, what's up, big bro? What's up, baby? Good to see you, man. Good to see you as well, man. I had the privilege of hearing you give, was it your first TEDx this past first weekend? TEDx. Yes, sir. Yes, man. You you absolutely crushed it. You crushed it. Uh, talk about just uh, the topic of that and what why that was important for you. Uh, well, the topic was how to have how to make every day at work a great day um, through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, as I've been doing this work all over the country and then some internationally as well. One of the things that has become apparent to me is that um, there are many people who have distanced themselves from diversity, equity, and inclusion because they don't see themselves as a part of it. They don't see themselves as a part of the solution. They don't see themselves as a, a, a vital part of the daily success of not just the work, but the but the way in which we experience work, the experiences that we create for others. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that um, the message was clear that first and foremost, diversity, equity, and inclusion is about everybody. And that while some parts of the work is hard and difficult and um, triggering, it's also about balance, right? right? And so the goal is to make sure that every single person has a great day at work, regardless of how they identify, regardless of their position, their title, regardless of how much money they're making, regardless of how much they're contributing to the bottom line. And what the studies show is that the more people you can get closer to having a great day at work consistently, the more productive people are and the mm -hmm. better the company does as a whole. And so getting to a place where we're able to not just do well, but reach our potential individually, collectively, and then corporately. Ooh -wee. I love that right there. I love that. If you can't tell, this man right here is a a, a wordsmith. He is a, a brilliant <laughs> man. Uh, I didn't even give you like a, much intro, but like you are... Like when, when I think of inspirations that I have, it is you are at the top of that list, bro. Cause uh you, bro. just I mean, to to know your your, you know, to know some of your backstory, then see your basketball career, but then what you've taken off and done in business as well. Um, it, it's just all through this service heart, this service lens, and I absolutely love it, bro. Like what you just described, it reminds me of a, you know, thinking of treat the CEO the same way you treat the custodian, right? That, that, that just something I've always been told, told and like wanted to live out in my life. And um, man, I just, I just wanted to give you your flowers early on. So if y'all, when that comes out, when that TEDx drops, y'all got to check that out. Cause it was fantastic. I'm biased. It was the best one of the day. My boy Shane, <laughs> check that out. <laughs> but I so I, 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 um. I think for people who follow you and who know you uh, from your Vandy basketball days, right? All-time leading scorer at Vandy. We know the Vandy, Shane, and some people kept up and know where you are now. But you, from Mississippi, grew up in New Orleans, is that right? Born in Mississippi, yep. Grew up in New Orleans, yep. Okay. That part, I don't think many people know much about in terms of who Shane Foster is from that era. Can you give us a little background on that piece of growing up in New Orleans? Yeah, man. So I spent the first six years of my life living with my grandparents. Um, my grandfather uh, served in our country's military um, and laid brick, literally built homes. He built the home that he and my grandmother um, have lived in since I was born, right? Um, wow. He actually built my high school, Bonneville High School. Um, wow. In, in, uh, Kenner, Louisiana. Um and and so and the church that we went to, he laid the brick for the church. He laid the brick for, <laughs> you know, the the pool that I was baptized in. Like that's 
Like that is the kind of, of man special. that he was. And, and yeah, it's so special, man. Um, and then my grandmother was a missionary in the church. So she made sure that, you know, we were in church every day, literally every day. Um, I was the kid that was, you know, when I would be cutting the grass or when I would be doing my chores, washing dishes, like I was singing church songs and and and, and preaching my own sermons. <laughs> like that's that was me as a kid. So when people, you know, ask, you know, especially now as I do keynotes and do a lot of speaking all over the country, it's like I've been speaking since I was a kid because that's that was my mm-hmm. upbringing, right? Like that's was that was that that's what was fun for me at that particular time in my life. Um, you know, just trying to replay church services. Right. Um, so, you know, that's kind of how, how I was. And then um, went to live with my mom and her first husband. And that was in the city of New Orleans um, and saw a lot of violence, honestly, saw a lot of domestic violence. Saw, you know, New Orleans was the murder capital of the world. So I saw a lot of violence in, in the neighborhood and community a lot of fights at school, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, for that next six years of my life, it was really just about survival, right? Like just Mm -hmm. figuring out um, the balance of how to be the church boy that they raised me to be, but also fit in, in one of the most violent cities in the country. Right. Um, And, and, you know, all of that comes with assimilating into that kind of culture um, while not losing myself, um, right. And, and, and witnessing domestic violence at home. Um, it was certainly my faith background, um, that, that kept me, you know, there were times when I wanted to commit suicide. There were times when mm. I wanted to run away from home, like even as a child, right. Cause it was those six years was tough. It was really, mm. really tough. Um, and so, you get past that and then I find a game of basketball and that was when I was able to find some identity um, that, that allowed me to be me without, you know, the pressure of trying to be something that I'm not right. Like yeah. was fitting, fitting in in school was trying to be something that I wasn't right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but because of basketball and I was good at it, people kind of left me alone. Right. So now I mm-hmm. wasn't getting pressured to do drugs. I wasn't getting pressured to fight. I wasn't getting pressured to do because now, and, and that's kind of the experience of an athlete. Like when you start becoming a really good athlete, now everybody's trying to protect you. Everybody's right. trying to make sure that you, you know, accomplish the the best that you possibly can. And so I certainly benefited from that privilege. Um, yep. And that's when things got better for me. And then of course my mom left her first husband and then I was able to, you know, kind of go off and do my own thing and, and, and play well and earn scholarships and all that kind of stuff. And things kind of took off from there. Man. Wow. That's a fantastic story. I mean, just to see the man that you are and, and what has shaped you. Uh, I, I knew you were a, a man of faith, but I didn't know you were a, a young boy preaching like you were preaching. That's, that's what's up. That's what's up, bro. Uh, <laughs> So you talked about a lot of things, you know, the 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 pressures from the the neighborhood, the school and all of that. You talked about, you know, the the mental anguish that it was was living in in all of that. Um what if you could if you could give little Shane some advice during those times or or just tell him something, what is something you think you would have told him? Um I think the biggest thing is that you know at the end of the day, it's, you don't, you don't have to necessarily fit in that, that you can, you can actually be you and that the more you are you consistently, the, the more you teach other people how to, how to handle you. Mm, right. Like, I like, like that. the more, the more authentic you live your life, um, you know, the, the, the less, certain things come your way. Like I talked about how, um, you know, once I found basketball, then people stopped asking me to do drugs. They stopped asking me to do alcohol. They stopped asking me to go to all the parties and all that kind of, cause they knew consistently I was in a gym. Right. Right. So you might as right. well not ask them. Right. Like it's that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. and so those, those expectations change. So I, so I think if, 
you know, if I could go back and tell the younger version of, of me anything, it would be that, you know, even though you feel the pressure um, to, to, to fit in and, and the, the peer pressure to show up like other people expect you to show up, that you can actually be you. Yes. And, and whatever yes. your biggest fear is, it's not going to happen. Absolutely. That authenticity, you can actually be you and, and live it out. It, it's so interesting, the overlaps in just communities and how you mentioned as an athlete, when you start to get good and you start to shine, like the community and people that know you, they support you in that endeavor and, keep, and shield you away from some of those negative things. Like I think back to uh, just coming up and I wasn't nearly as good as the sports that I played as you were at basketball, but still it was like, we're not going to pass him the joint. We're not going to uh, get him. He's not going to get in the car with us on this ride. Like we, we're going to take care of him when it comes to certain things. Uh, but then I think for me, it was, it was some periphery folks who really didn't know me that well. That was still just like, Hey, you ready to join the, the family business? And you know, for, for me, that family business was selling drugs. And uh, I think, you know, just from having it instilled early on that, you know, I, I was, I was different, not better, but different. And people were mm-hmm. shielding me, then, you know, I got to keep going down that path, man. So you got a, you got an interesting shirt on for the people who are just listening to this. It says real men respect, and I can't see the bottom of it. Women. Woo. That's powerful right there. Real men respect yes, women. I, I think I've seen you wear that multiple times. Uh, tell me the significance behind that and and just I mean I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, so the nonprofit um initiative that I'm the executive director for, a men together where we engage men and boys to end violence against women and girls, um created this shirt. And it's it's a message, it's a, a mantra, um it's a movement, right? And it's 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 all about um giving men the permission to show up differently than perhaps what they've seen, what they've witnessed, what they've heard consistently. Um, and that ultimately being a real man includes respecting women, right? It's yes. not limited to just respecting women. There's all kind of stuff that men do, right? Mm-hmm. But on that list and at the top of that list should be the fact that we respect women and girls, right? Like, like that, like Mm -hmm. there has to be a level of, um, of, of integrity when it comes to our relationships, our behaviors towards, um, and that's whether women are present or not. Right. So that means even with my conversations with the fellas, I still need to be respectful to women. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, and so you're modeling that behavior. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I love, I love it. And, and, uh, I could I could see so many other words thrown in there. Celebrates women, uh, just uplifts, supports all of that, and that's I mean yeah. you encapsulate that through through a men together. Uh, talk about um, a men and how how you came about being the executive director of that because I mean f- to go from from basketball to p- playing professionally and then you g- jump into a world of was it unknown for you or did you have this path kind of set out before? Man, if you would have asked me 10 years ago would I have been doing this, I'd have said, heck no. <laughs> um, but but if I'm honest, you know, as I look back over my life experiences, the reality is this was in the cards always. Mm-hmm. You know, I've always been one who values and respects women and girls because I was raised by women and strong women, you know, who disrespect was not an option. Right. It yep. was always respect your elders, respect women. Right. Yes. Um, and so that and, and then as I got older um, and even got into high school, um, you know, I was always the guy that if I saw a girl, you know, being called out of her name or I saw somebody, you know, acting, you know, demeaning or devaluing towards the women um, in my presence, like I was the guy that would go to their defense. Right. Like mm-hmm. I was the guy that would, would would go stand there and be like, hey, whatever you do to her, I dare you try to do it to me. Yeah. Right. And if, yeah. you, if you don't have the if you don't have the guts to do it to me, you shouldn't be doing it to her. Right. Right. Um, so I was I was always that kind of guy. But once I got engaged in the work, 
um, you know, it was really all about using the platform that I had been given from from basketball to make a difference, to make an impact, and um, to have a message that people would listen to and gravitate towards. Um, ultimately, to end the very thing that I saw as a kid, which is domestic violence, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've been able to impact more than a million kids across the country now. Wow. Uh, teaching the wow. High value and respect women and girls. Yeah. Wow, man. Can, I'm a, I'm a, I ain't clapped on this podcast yet, but that deserves an applause, man. Damn. You, man. Like, for real, bro. Uh, I, I think um, in the spirit of embracing vulnerability and transparency, uh, I grew up and in, in, uh, was exposed to domestic violence as well, uh, along with the, you know, all the other violence in the neighborhood and, 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 and things. And um, for me, I think in the back of my mind, knowing one that my mom was a victim of it and then so many other women, I I had this intention of I will never ever in my life do that. And yeah. then fast forward in a relationship that I was in late high school, early college, found myself in just emotional turmoil from all the things that was going on in my life personally. Uh, but then in this relationship, I felt like I was losing somebody who I had loved for, for a long time at that point. And my, my reaction was control. I got to control everything. I got to control every aspect, the emotions, the behavior. And that ended up pushing her further away. And when I got to a point where I felt like that control was slipping out of my hands, I put hands on her. And it's like it is literally the number one greatest regret that I have in life because I I feel like in most of all of my interactions, I was you in the scenario of if you're gonna do something to her, do it to me. But yeah. in this in this moment, I became the the perpetrator of the greatest one of the greatest things that I feared and one of the things that I want wanted to most avoid. And I I I mean, for years, just beat myself up about it, apologize profusely, and I don't think anything can undo the damage that you cause. Uh, at least that, that's where I'm feeling. And so it's like one of those things that weighs on me heavily, man. I ain't gonna lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first and foremost, man, I think, I think it's important to recognize the courage it takes to say what you just said. Right. To, to, to admit that, you know, I messed up. Right. Like I, I screwed up and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and it's a screw up that I can't get back. Right. Mm-hmm. The, the, the mental um, damage, the, the, you know, the aces, the, all, all the stuff that comes along with experiencing violence. Right. Like, and to, and to impose that on somebody else, once it's done, it's done, right? The the trust right. uh, that gets lost, uh, the the heartbrokenness, the fear, you know, all of those things that come. So I, I applaud you for for taking the step of of recognizing and admitting, like this is what I did. It was absolutely wrong, and I regret it, and I apologize profusely for it, right? Um, but then the other side of it is, how do we make sure that in the heat of a moment um, that we have already practiced the positive mm-hmm. habits so that in that moment we make different decisions, right? Because mm-hmm. we all get upset. We all get angry. We all have arguments you know, with the people in our life that we love and care about, but violence can't be an option. And the only right. way that we found that violence is not the option is that we prepare ourselves on the front end for that moment. So we normalize walking away. We normalize going to a spot or, or, or people in our lives that we can call that can de-escalate and bring us back down to earth. We normalize, you know, being able to, to say what we mean and even be able to say it directly without causing harm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so it's it's but it's an everyday practice, man, um, of, of, you know, of, of having a level of integrity for even when I'm upset. 
right? Like that's something that I've been thinking a lot about, you know, um, as, as I'm, as I'm now going through a divorce and, and, and getting back on the scene and, and trying to figure out where, where I fit in and all that kind of stuff, man. Like, it's like how, how a person gets angry matters. Like yeah. what does, what does upset for you look like? Right. Mm-hmm. Cause, cause every, everybody can kick it and, and, and be great when all things are good. When we eat shrimp and steak right. and lobster, right. Like it, like, oh, you yeah. know, when we celebrate crawfish, tossing back <laughs> drinks and whatever, you know, everybody can be good, but, but when you get upset, who is that person? Right. Yes. Because, because that person is who I'm with long-term. Mm-hmm. That that person mm-hmm. I'm 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 assured to meet <laughs> possibly yeah. once a month. You know what I'm saying? So what does that <laughs> look like? Um yeah. it has become very, very important to me. Man, I wanna first thank you for your grace. I don't know if you remember this, but um it was it was one of the first times that we like sat down. I think we had dinner or we were at some event and Uh, I think I had just gotten married or was about to or something. And you came up to me and you said, uh, the number one thing between you two is it has to be grace. And and before you said that, I I had heard the word. I had never truly embraced it or understood it. And so after you said that, I was like, that's interesting. Let me go. And I looked up the definition. Don't think it's sufficient. I I just like kept trying to find what grace actually meant. You good? Yeah. Okay. I was trying to find what grace actually meant for me. And and you just, you just gave such a great example of that because as someone on the front lines of, of the fight against, that's probably a bad choice of words, but against domestic violence uh, to, to provide that grace to me in a, in a moment where uh, I let my emotions turn to the violence that I had grown so accustomed to. Um, thank you for that, man. Thank you. And yeah. I, uh, man, I just, I just I applaud you on so many levels, man. So you, you, your book, you have a book, what hurt didn't hinder, what hurt didn't hinder. Um, you've talked about some of the things that I'm sure hurt, but is there, was there a specific moment where you're like, that's the title of my book, or these are the things that hurt that didn't hinder me? Like where, where did the title of that book come from? So interestingly enough, I started writing that book when um, I was playing my last year of basketball and I was out in um, in Bakersfield, California and playing in the NBA's uh, developmental league. It was the D League back then. Now it was called the G League. Mm-hmm. And the name of the book at that time was The Lessons I've Learned Along the Way. Mm. So I always wanted to be able to um, shine a positive light on negative experiences. But then as I was going through the, with my ghostwriter and talking through, you know, all the various experiences that I've had across my life, the thing that I, that, that was a, a theme was this idea that we all go through things we all experience hardships. We all have, you know, moments in our life that are difficult to overcome. And oftentimes people get stuck in the experience and they aren't able to get to the success that should follow. Right. Mm. Like, like it's, yeah. it's sunniest after it storms. Mm-hmm. Right. The, the sun shines brightest after a storm, right? And and that's been my experience. Like So with what I went through as a child and in some of the things I went to, through even as an adult, it was like that didn't stop me from being the all-time leading scorer in Vanderbilt school history. That didn't stop me from getting to the NBA. That didn't stop me from, from being an entrepreneur and starting my own business. It didn't stop me from building a nonprofit initiative that engages, you know, a million kids and, and so many other adults around the world. It didn't stop me from being a, an international public speaker, right? Like it, it didn't stop those things from happening. And so right. if people can 
can learn anything from from my story and life experiences, it is that what happens to you should not define you. There should mm-hmm. always be a shiny moment that's coming for you, but you can't mm-hmm. get stuck and you can't give up, right? What mm-hmm. happened is not the totality. It's just it's just a building block upon which your success will live. Man, I oof, I love that. You gave me goosebumps, man. Like that's <laughs> that's real. Like I I think that's so one of the studying trauma and understanding how 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 trauma works in the mind and in the body. I like if I was at I was I was actually asked the definition of of trauma and it's it's that disconnect between a past hurt and your current reality. And it's the the work that you must do if you've experienced trauma and, and you are living in that moment you're you do feel like you're defined is you gotta you gotta find a way to get up out of that hurt you gotta find a way to come back to the present moment and to the reality because like you said like you 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 can't be stuck there you can't be stuck there those are you can you can have defining moments out of that and you can turn all of those quote unquote losses into lessons all the mistakes into whatever you want to make them and and be the success that you want to be however you want to define success so i love that man that that book is uh is powerful, bro. And like, like I I was shaking reading it, I was crying reading it. It was, it was a lot. It touched on a lot of emotions. So y'all go get that book. What hurt didn't hinder, man. Uh Shane Foster has a fantastic book. Um, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna lighten it up a little bit. I wanna talk sure. about, I wanna talk about basketball. I don't hear you talking about basketball as much anymore. And I wanna talk <laughs> about basketball. Cause okay. I think I could have dunked on you. No, I'm just kidding. Don't don't beat me up next time. <laughs> no. I um I I I remember watching you just on TV going to Memorial and seeing you just light it up. Um, and when you had your book signing, um, uh, I guess this was uh, last year, maybe year before. Uh, you talked about the experience at the Mississippi State game, and that's something that that me and Katie we talk about a lot, just cause like. You balled out in that game. Talk about what ha- what led up to that moment, the feelings that you had during that game and after that. Because I just I just want to I want to hear that. It gets me excited. Well, here's the thing: the thing that people don't often talk about is how many shots I missed in that same game. <laughs> right? Like, like I started off broke. Like I couldn't hit water if I fell out of boat. Um, <laughs> but. But again, like just like the the theme of the book, right? Like it was it was painful to be in the middle of a game that is so critical and so important, not only to my career, to my teammates, to the fans, to the basketball program, and literally be the guy and suck for a little bit. <laughs> like I I was sucking, right? And and but at halftime, I go in the locker room. And I literally prayed, God, you, not me. Like, let, mm. get me out of the way and allow mm. me to go out there and play for my teammates and play for my family and play for these fans. Um, and and because the first half, I was making it about me. Like, I just wanted to mm. do well so bad, and, and it wasn't happening. And once I got myself out of the way, then it was on and popping. Then I, then I, I, ain't, yeah. I don't even think I missed a shot the whole second half. Right? Yeah, like it was, it was that kind of experience, man. Um, and, and certainly one of the best games that I've ever played. Um, but you know, and, and, and my teammates, man, I can't say enough about the incredible teammates that I had that were so selfless, right? Like, like when you know a guy is hot, sometimes you end up passing up good shots for you to make sure that they get the ball and and keep feeding the hot hand guys setting screens for me and, you know, pump faking and then getting it to me. Right. Like, and, and it's, it's those kind of things, but then even our coaching staff, right. Our coaching staff doing a great job of keeping everybody, you know, mind focused on, on the game. And even in moments where like, I remember coach Stahl is literally saying, yo, if anybody else shoots the ball other than Shane, you're coming out. (laughs) <laughs> like that's deflating, man. Like that's like, like <laughs> I could imagine. Like if I was Alex Gordon, I'd be sitting there like, man, what you oh, mean? I came man. here on full scholarship too, right? right. Like, right. You know what I mean? So, so you know, it's 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 so much, you know, behind the scenes that goes into that kind of a performance. 
you know, that don't get talked about. So whenever I'm given an opportunity to, you know, I, I, I try to make sure that I focus on those kind of things, man, because it, it matters. Yeah, man. And what 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 would you come out? What were your stats coming out of that game? 42. 42 of them things. Woof, man. Lit it up. Lit it up. You brought up yeah. Coach Stallings. And uh in the in your TED talk, you talked about uh approach you you had. You you came to the coaching staff and you had something to say. What what'd you have to say to them? And how what did that look like? What did the team look like before and what turned around after you said what you had to say? Well, the, the the atmosphere was just so negative, man. Like, so I'm at, I'm study asking coach, like, dude, why are you so upset? And you literally are making three million dollars a year, got an incredible family, who you love going play baseball with Jacob, right? Like, what is you actually mad about, right? Like every day, you can't possibly be mad every day. You get to you come to work in shorts and a t shirt, dude. <laughs> Making like, three come million. on, man. <laughs> Making three million, right? Like, I'm like, yo, come on, man. And and so myself, Alex Gordon, and Damari Carroll, um, all the guy, three guys that I came in my freshman year with, and and we we all, you know, had done well. I made the all freshman team after my my freshman year, um, first team all SEC as a sophomore, you know. So I had some options, right? Mm-hmm. Like I I. Could have gone anywhere else I wanted to go. Um, and so we just went in his office, man, and just said, listen, dude, like, think you're a great guy, but how you show up in practice every day, this ain't working. Mm-hmm. And, and and on top of it not working, it would be different if we were going to the tournament, going to Final Four every yeah. year. Right? Like, so, so, you know, if you Bill Self, you Roy Williams, and you bringing it in like that every year, by all <laughs> means, be as negative as you want to be. We winning? Cool. <laughs> Right in a couple of years, I'll be making the same three million. Cool, <laughs> yeah. equal trade, right? But if that's not the case, dude, we didn't come here to have a negative experience every day, and on top of that, not be winning at a, mm-hmm. at a high level. Yeah, right. So, and and you know, I've always been the type of person that has always been very aware, keenly aware of the experiences other people are having, and so I was just honest with them. I said, dude, not only are we not having fun. You don't look like you're enjoying coaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you, you're literally coming here upset every day. Like, this can't be fun for wow. you. You know what I'm saying? And so we, we got to switch this up. And and so th- those are the options. We either switch it up or we <laughs> yeah. don't. Like, it's, it's, just, it's just that simple, right? Um, and he had been feeling it too. And, and, and obviously for, for him as a coach, he under no circumstance did he want to lose all three of us. Mm-hmm. Right. Like that was going to look real right. bad for yeah. him. All in the same class. You know yeah. That would have been ugly. Yeah, man. Uh, Cause guys transfer all the time, but like, not like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and, and high character guys. Yeah. Too. Yeah, exactly. Guys that we wasn't, guys wasn't in trouble. Guys would, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, so I think all of that played a role in, you know, him, coming to to grips with the fact that all right cool the thing the way that i've done this in the past is not going to work for this group um and so we got to switch it up and he his willingness to partner with us on that um gave us a chance to be really good um but it did it it's, it's not like it just flipped the switch immediately in fact the first six games of the next season um i think we we ended up being like like three and three or something like that mm-hmm. to, to start the year. Um, but we kept with it, man. And and I give Alex Gordon a ton of credit. Like he was the guy who came in to practice every single day, every single day, running around the gym. Let's have a great day. We having a great day it. today, yeah. baby. Let's go. Come on. And then, and so he, he was responsible for the players. I was responsible for the coaches. Wow. So he was running around getting getting all the players and stuff ready to ready to rock, and I I go over there, hey coach, come on baby, let's go baby. Like, hey, I don't see you smiling, I don't see you smiling. Come on, coach, don't 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 make me don't make me call your wife. Get her in here. Come on, wow. coach. You know what I'm saying? That's like, leadership so right there. That's changing. That's leadership, Man. right? Like that's changing the culture. And now now everybody's smiling. Everybody wants to come to work. Everybody's busting their butt. You know what I'm saying? And and what ended up happening is. 
we went to the Sweet 16. Mm-hmm. That year, yeah. we beat the most ranked teams in the country. We sold out Memorial Gym. That thing was rocking, mm-hmm. right? We beat Florida, the number one team in the country. Yeah. Right? And then going in, then my senior year, I was the number one shooting guard in the country the entire year. It was killer. Yeah. Right? We were undefeated at home. Right? Like beat UT unreal, when they man. were number one. Yeah. After after they after they beat uh Derrick Rose and them in mm-hmm. Memphis, they came to see us and we beat yeah. them. <laughs> right? Like it was it was that kind of thing, man. And it was a it was an amazing time to be and it was so much fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. My last two years in college were the most fun. Um and it was challenging. We worked hard. Right. Like we we worked our butt off, man. But it's it's easy, it's easy to push past you know, being tired and cramps and, you know, being injured and all that kind of stuff when you love the environment that you're Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I, I I think about my experience on the football team, my years. So Bobby Johnson was the coach. Uh, when I came in as a freshman, we went two and 10. Uh, then right before my sophomore year, Bobby Johnson announces that he is retiring. Uh, but we still had the same coaching staff. And everyone knew, everyone knew that that coaching staff was going to get fired at the end of the year. And it was rumored that Bobby Johnson did what he did at the time that he did so that they could have a whole year to look for jobs and and just be there. But the environment around the team, around the, the, the facility and practice and games was so lackluster. It was, I, and I came from uh, Montgomery Bell Academy where we roll and we win in games and we expect to win and we're pissed off if we don't win and getting to Vandy, Vandy football. And it's like, we, we just went two and 10 and people are laughing. People are going out. People are excited about that. And I'm just like, what, what is this? Like, cause I, I can't accept this. I don't want this. And so that the, the year Bobby Johnson retired, we had the uh, interim head coach, Robbie Caldwell and our, in our, you know, regular coaching staff, we go two and 10 again. And that last, I believe it was the last game of the season. I had, I was, as a walk-on, I had earned, you know, a spot on the team. I'm traveling with the squad. I'm playing. And uh, I get, I get, I see the list. I'm on the list for the game. And I'm like, you know what? It's something I'd rather do other than come to this game. And as a kid who grew up longing to run down that field, I, I, I look back at it now. And it's like, dang, like that's, that's a huge shift, but. That's how bad the team environment was. I did not show up for that last game. And like, I knew the coaches were gone. Like it was no repercussions. It was nothing about, it was like, but I would rather hang out with my buddies, play pool or, you know, do my homework than go to that game. And like that next year, James Franklin came in and it like, he, he was, he came in with his leadership. He came in with his energy and I, I, I think it was like you and Alex, like he got that whole, the whole team, the whole community back around Vandy football. And you saw that in the per- performance and the production that we had after that. So like, yep. it's huge. It is so huge. Like yep. having a good environment for, for your team is, is vital, man. Like, so dang, I love yeah. that. I love and, that story. And it's, and it's the same way in business. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Talk about but, it. But the problem is, the problem is, and I said this in the TED Talk, right? We've normalized that work has to be hard mm-hmm. and that the best leaders are often the hardest people to work mm-hmm. with. Yes. You see, you see it in movies, yep. right? You see the coach yelling, screaming, throwing stuff, right? You got the whole um, uh, Bobby Knight situation. He throwing, <laughs> throwing chairs on the floor. You got eight up rough, you know, going crazy on play. Like, they, we've normalized mm-hmm. that and didn't realize that they were in they, those teams were successful. Those companies were successful in spite of, not because mm-hmm. of. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Like that's that's the reality. But then we never stop to consider what could those teams, what could those companies actually accomplish if the leadership was mm-hmm. better? Yes. If the atmosphere, like right, like so, so as I as I as I coach CEOs across the country, I'm like, literally, there's a difference between where you are, what you've achieved thus far, and what your potential mm-hmm. is. Let's go get that let's potential. Go get it, yeah. Right, like let's let's go get that because when when we get there, everybody benefits, mm-hmm. everybody wins. Mm-hmm. 
right? Yeah, absolutely. And we're not negatively impacting our mental health to go get our potential. Yes, yes. So now we're not sacrificing the kind of father we are at home. We're not sacrificing the kind of spouse we are at home. We're not sacrificing the kind of friend and and and, and brother and sibling and child we are to our, our parents, right? We're not sacrificing. Now we get to do both. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Now now we get to be successful and have a successful home yes. life, right? Yes. Now we get to be authentic and be successful. Oh, I love it. I love it. But it's all about that atmosphere. We got to normalize that behavior right there. That's what we normalize it now. Ooh, I love that right there. I love that. Um, Shane, tell me, um, so you you talked about your the impact of your grandparents. Um, when you moved and lived with your mom and her first husband and, and whomever after that, what was their impact on your life? Because, I mean, like, you are such a grounded person. You're so grounded. And I know a lot of that was instilled early on, but like throughout those years, what, where did that impact come from? Well, I think, you know, I give a lot of credit to, to my grandparents, obviously, you know, first six years of my life living and growing up with them. Um, but I also give a lot of credit to my mom and, and my dad, right? Like my biological father has always been in my life. Um, certainly one of my, my biggest role models um, and just consistent. Mm. Right. Mm. Like, like he was the one, even while I was playing ball, who kept me focused in the moment, like be where your feet are. Right. Like as you're going to accomplish all of these things, make sure that you stop and consider the experiences of people around mm -hmm. you. Right. Make sure you, you value people. Right. Um, even when I was in high school, you know, he was like, you know, make, make sure like these people who are your janitors, who are your teachers today, like they're going to remember you for the rest of their lives. Mm, wow. Because of getting a chance to watch you wow. play. Right. They're going to be telling their kids and grandkids stories about being able to teach you and being able to coach you and, and being able to clean your locker. Mm. Don't take those people for mm. granted. Right. You have an opportunity to have a positive impact on these people's lives in a way that other people don't. So don't take that for granted, right? And so when you talk about being grounded, that's how I was raised, yeah. yeah. right? In the midst of being a star athlete, that was the messaging that I was receiving on a regular basis, mm. right? I'll never forget um, my, my family um, and come up to a Vanderbilt game and we went out to eat, we went to Old Charlie's afterwards. and. Um, apparently one of the Vandy fans was going there to eat after the game as well. And we were all sitting in, in the lobby area, but they couldn't see me. Mm -hmm. And so they came in, they wearing their Vandy gear and they yelling and screaming, all excited. And so one of them, they started talking to my mom and my little sister, you know, did you see the game? Oh my God, it was great. And that number 32, I wish I could just give him a <laughs> hug, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and my mama said, well, wait one minute. I'm going to go get him. For yeah. And she came and got me and I get, went over there and gave him a hug and, and hugged him, you know, and talked to him for a little bit. But that's just, that's who we are. Yeah. Right? Like, that's that's just who we are, man. My, my senior night game that we talked about before, you know, I stayed, like, we almost couldn't go to dinner that night because I stayed and signed every wow. single person autograph who wanted me to took pictures with them and their kids and like we shutting down the gym like folks like cleaning up like yo y'all gotta get <laughs> out of here you know what i'm saying but like that's just who i am in my heart because that's how i was yeah. raised you never take people for granted man because they're not they're not they're not trying to get everybody all right now. exactly like, yeah right like they're not trying to take a picture with everybody exactly. man you know they, they weren't even trying to take pictures with everybody on the team <sighs> right like and so just, just never, never take that for granted, man. I love that. That's a great message to our young athletes and and everybody, everybody, really. But I'm thinking of the young athlete. You said the person they're gonna be bragging about. They got to clean your locker one day. That's huge. Like I, I that perspective has never crossed my mind, and I think that is absolutely, definitely needed from all of our people who make success of whatever their life is gonna be, man. Like that's huge, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think about, I mean, even from a business standpoint, right? Like you, you get a company that starts off small mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they break into the fortune 500, yeah. right? Like 
the fact that that company reached that pinnacle, every single person that was on that journey, their lives are impacted Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Right, their lives are and 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 they're they're championing folks and 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 looking up to the CEO. You have a responsibility mm-hmm. to make sure that you don't take those people for mm-hmm. granted. Because without people, the business never gets there. Right, exactly. Right, like you, you think about you think about companies like like Amazon, for example. All the folks that go and pick these products and make sure that they get sent to the proper those are the people who make Amazon what it yeah. is. Yeah. So as so as the president, CEO of Amazon, you can't take those people for granted because you don't make you don't make the money without right. them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, but we don't. But we don't often treat people like that, and it's wild. Mm-hmm. Man, it's wild. Man, you absolutely right, bro. Like it's it's it's, it's wild. Um, you, it's it's two routes I want. Well, two questions i think i have before we close out here it's um i think you you alluded to going through a divorce currently and mm-hmm. um i mean knowing you and knowing your partner um when it, that that hurt me uh to hear but it's not about me but um just um i don't know what how do i want to ask this um talk about what shane feels through all of that you know, like I think people separate, people break up for reasons, uh, you know, out there. But what inside of Shane's heart, what are you feeling as as you navigate this terrain? Um, you know, it's it's a bit of a roller coaster. Um, it's kind of like what I what I said before about you know how a person acts, responds how they show up when they're upset um, is, is, is really important. And my little sister, when, when I told my little sister what I was going through, um, had no idea how she would respond, but what she said has really stuck with me. And she says, Shane, I'm proud of you for choosing you. Mm, yeah. I I've given, all that I am to other people. Um, and, and there's been numerous, numerous times, um, that I gave and sacrificed myself in order to give. Mm -hmm. And when you do that consistently, um, you, you get to a point where you've normalized putting yourself on a back burner yep. to where not only is that, not only is that what you are doing, but it's also what your partner expects from mm-hmm. you. Um, and so I'm in a process now of learning. I've always been selfless. And so it's been hard to learn how to choose me. Wow. Yeah. How to choose my own mental health. How to, you know, to to make sure that I'm doing the things that I need to do for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that that I make me happy before I'm expecting someone else to contribute to that happiness. Um, and so it's it's been tough, man. And and even in in um in counseling and therapy that I go to myself the common theme is always saying it's okay for you to choose you. Yeah. Like, like it's like, it's actually okay for you to choose you. Mm -hmm. Like everybody else can be an adult and figure it out. Something you need to choose you. It's okay. Yeah. Right. And so for, I think for a long time, I, I personally didn't give myself permission to choose me. Mm. And so now I'm in the process of learning you know, how to do that and being okay with doing that and being okay with other people figuring it out on their own without. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, You know, we've, we've heard in, in, in business and life that you can't pour from an empty cup. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm, I'm learning how to fill my own cup now. Yes. Ah, I love, I love that. It's, it's, it's beautiful that that is 
the lesson that is being learned in this difficult time. Uh, that's that's something I resonate with deeply uh, throughout most of my life up into literally the the climax of of what you know prompted the book for me even starting to write the book. Um, I I was pouring I was pouring from an empty cup. I was giving all of me to so many people and some to you know financially, emotionally, uh, all my time and all of that, and it got to a point where it it was so negative to my mental health. Like I'm on the floor and a, unable to to move, unable to do to make a, a a full thought, a full sentence. And that's a lesson that I'm learning is, is you know, self-care. I say self-care is sacred, not selfish. I think we have to look at it that way, as opposed to thinking that if I do prioritize myself, it is going to be at the detriment of all these people I care about. But it's like, no, if, if you don't prioritize yourself, that's what's going to be at their detriment. And it's, it's just like the airplane. You got to put your mask on first before you put on someone else's. And so I, I applaud you for finding that lesson throughout this. And I, I encourage you to just keep seeking that and keep loving yourself, man, because that, that is absolutely huge, bro. I love it. Man, I'll tell you something else. I was, um, I was blessed to be a keynote speaker for the World Diversity and Leadership Conference. And the woman who spoke right before me got on stage and she said, everybody close your eyes and I want you to tell yourself, I love you. Mm. She did that seven times. And dude, like, t by the time I opened my eyes, like, tears were falling down my eyes. And I realized that this was the first time in my entire life I told me I love wow. you. Wow. Wow. Mm. Right? Like, I'm, I'm, I was bought, like, I had to get myself together before I got on stage. Mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Because I was, I was, I was really, really, you know, mentally and emotionally feeling the weight of like, dude, you've not been kind to mm -hmm. you. Like you give and you give grace to people and you love on people and you give of yourself to people all the time, but I've not been kind to me. Yeah. And so a part of this process for me choosing me is me loving me too. Gosh. Like I, I am worthy of love. I'm love. I'm, I'm, I am worthy of the same energy that I give to everybody Absolutely. else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? I should be able to expect what I give in return. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the interesting thing about that particularly around faith and around sports, it's been so ingrained in me that that you just give 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 and you don't worry about getting in return because God is going to be the rewarder. And and but and and while that's true, in relationship, you're supposed to get back what you get. Yes, reciprocity, man, huge. Right, like reciprocity is so so important, and so giving myself the permission to expect to be treated mm. well, right? Mm. To expect to be loved, to expect grace, to expect forgiveness. Not because, and it's not a, it's not a, it's not because Shane is so great. It's because that's what I give. Yeah, absolutely. And so if that's what I'm giving, I deserve to get that in return. You absolutely do. Hey, I, 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 I got to say this. I love you, brother. I absolutely love you, man. I, I love you back, man. Man, like, oh, like, it's so, it's, it's so refreshing to have this conversation and to to you know have the world one day hear this conversation because I, as as men as uh black men who come from environments where this conversation is not often had like we need more of this because now now somebody's going to hear that and they're in a, a earlier phase of their life where they're saying damn I'm going to have to love on myself like I didn't realize that until this moment like I didn't realize that until I started going to therapy that I did not love myself. And so now every time I journal, the last line I write in my journal is, I love you, comma, me. I got to tell myself that every single day when I journal. 
And so I'm I'm glad you shared that because that's gonna that's gonna be a gem for somebody out there. That's gonna be such a huge thing. When when you talk about love, I know you got so much love while you were on the court. But in a city like Nashville, being a how how tall? Six six eight six nine? Six six. Six six. Wow. Six, six. You look so much taller than that. Um, so six six black man walking around the the city of Nashville. How was the love shown or just different or not shown when you were around not in your jersey? Well, uh, what this brings up for me is a conversation that the late David Williams and I had. Um, David was my my mentor and father figure for so long, man, and I, I miss him so much. Uh, when I retired from basketball, he was one of the first people I went back to see. And sitting in his office, he said, Shane, you got about maybe 10 years of people in Nashville remembering what you did on the basketball floor. Mm. He said, because the people who watch those games from kids all the way up through adults, there's so much transition in life that that people move to different cities, people pass away, new businesses come in. You got more people coming in to the city who won't have the experience of watching you play. Mm -hmm. And he said, my challenge to you is that you don't do something for the purpose of just making money, but you do something that's going to be impactful. That's going to outlive you. Because of David Williams, I chose the route of working with the YWCA and building this national program that engages men to end violence against women and girls, because that's work that's going to outlive me. Absolutely. And the evidence of that is when I'm getting off a plane in Nashville and uh, uh, somebody comes and taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, you're Shane Foster. And I say, yeah, what's up? And they say, Thank you for the work you're doing around domestic violence. Wow. Wow. That's huge. Oh. Right? So, yes. so, so, when I, so when I think about how I've been received in Nashville off the floor, and I've had so many people come up to me and, and, and say this. I had someone uh, come up to me and say this after the TEDx talk that people, a lot of people know me for what I did on the basketball court but people are going to remember me for the work I'm doing now. Yes. I love that. Because this is touching people's life mm-hmm. um, in a way that basketball couldn't. And so I'm, I'm still well received in the city. Uh, I'm still treated great. Um, and, and honestly, it's, it's, it's caused um, some pause for me in terms of moving away from the city. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, when, when you're treated so well in a place, and for me, the last time that I was walking around a city and nobody recognized me was high school. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I'm 37 years old. That means there's been a good 20 years. That's two decades <laughs> of walking around and people asking me to sign autographs and take pictures and calling people I've never met before, but they know me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's hard to walk away from that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I had to ask myself the question, who am I if people don't recognize me? Ooh. Mm. Mm. Right. Like, like if people don't, gravitate towards me Mm -hmm. or people are not you know reaching out trying to help me do stuff or to you know and and that's that's been difficult yeah you know if i'm being honest and so i think i think the other part of this new life for me man is is giving myself permission to go in and find out yeah like who who am i aside from that yes and and know that the same grace that has followed me my whole life will follow me wherever i go God, that's powerful. I, I love that. That's absolutely powerful. I got a segment that I do, quick, rapid response. First thing that comes to mind, you let me know. Okay, what comes to mind when you hear the word vulnerability? 
authentic, real. Mm. If you could have a conversation with anybody, living or dead, who would it be? Kobe Bryant. Ooh, Mamba. What is one of your favorite childhood memories? Mm. One of my favorite childhood memories. Getting excited to go spend time with my dad. Mm. Yes. What is a book or movie that everyone should read or watch? Um, besides the movie, your, I would say I was gonna say besides what <laughs> hurt right. didn't hinder. Yeah, um, if I'm gonna say a movie, there's a great, great um, documentary on Netflix called "Who We Are." That is really, really powerful. I love it. Um, yeah, I would say that. I, I love it, and I will echo that. That is fantastic. I'm gonna add one in here right now. It's a it's a documentary um, called. Um, the feminist and cell block why when you think about toxic masculinity the patriarchy it's a great book so i think that's one that everyone should watch as well um what do you do what's one thing that you do to relax when you're feeling stressed play piano mm, okay and then last outside of a men together podcast what is the number one podcast you've ever experienced Embracing vulnerability with Reggie D. Ford. There it is, man. I appreciate you, Shane, big bro. Like, I again, I can't thank you enough for the inspiration, for the motivation, and and just being a a, a big bro to me, man. Thank you so much. And how can people get in touch with you? Like, I know people want to talk to you. How can they get in touch with you? <laughs> You can go to my website, ShaneFoster.com. Follow me on all social media platforms, ShaneFoster underscore 32. Um, and also check out their Men Together podcast. Check that out. Yes. Shane, with all the things you could be doing and all the places you could be, I appreciate you for being here with me, Embracing Vulnerability. Thank you, bro. Thank you for joining us for another powerful episode of Vulnerability Muscle. I hope you found inspiration and valuable insights that resonate with you. If you're enjoying this journey of self-discovery and empowerment, there are a few ways you can support the podcast. First, make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. If you've been moved by our conversations and the mission of redefining vulnerability, please consider leaving a review. Your feedback not only motivates us, but also helps others discover the podcast. Share your thoughts on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you tune in. And don't forget to spread the word. Follow us on Instagram at Vulnerability Muscle for updates. And you can connect with me personally at Reggie D. Ford on all platforms. Visit VulnerabilityMuscle.com for additional resources and upcoming episodes. And remember, embracing vulnerability is strength. Thanks for being a part of the journey. Until next time, stay empowered, stay vulnerable, and keep flexing that vulnerability muscle.